Big games tonight all over the place, including uh, Brentford against Brighton, which is live on the Talk Sport app. Uh, big day for Brighton yesterday. Um, they set a new record for the largest profit made by an English football club, 122.8 million pounds last season. Their accounts were announced yesterday. The profits were thanks in large part to the sale of players such as Alexis McAllister to Liverpool, Mark Kukurea to Chelsea. But even without income from transfers, Brighton were still in profit. So how are they doing it in a time of Profit and sustainability rules and points deductions all over the Premier League. How have Brighton shown that success can be built organically? Let's speak to their CEO, Paul Barber, who's on the programme this morning. Uh, good morning to you and congratulations, Paul. Morning, Sam. Thanks very much. Um, what is it about the Brighton environment? How have you done it? How have you managed to secure success in the face of everybody else's troubles? Well, I think the first thing to say is we haven't done it overnight. <laughs> it's been a it's been a decade of hard work from a lot of people. And uh, obviously that starts at the top with the chairman and the vision he had for the club uh, a dozen or so years ago when, when, he, when he took over. Um, and, and then since then, a lot of hard work to get our processes uh, as good as they can be. Um, obviously that, that starts really with, with, with player recruitment. That's a critical part of, of any football club's um, operations and success. Um, and then off the field, just trying to maximise, you know, what we've got. You know, we haven't got the biggest stadium, um, but we we fill it every week. We haven't uh, got the biggest sponsorship revenues, but we've got great world-class partners who we've been with a long time and, and we work hard to make sure, you know, we deliver for them. Uh, and we've got great staff in all areas of the club that, that work really hard um, and deliver week after week. And, you know, Managing our costs and, and keeping ourselves as as profitable as we can um, is is a, is, a, is an important part of our process. And so far, it's it's gone well. But there's still a lot of work to do. And we also know in football things can go the other way very quickly. So you know we we've still got much more we think we can do and, and we need to do. Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about that and how you guard about against the idea of that change is, is, is probably important going forward because people will talk about the fact that there's a lot of clubs that develop talent like you do, find young talent, sell it on at a higher price, make a profit as a result of that uh, and then look to regenerate underneath and bring in replacements. That model has worked and served you well up until this point, but how long can you keep sustaining that sort of selling good players that you find and then regenerating the squad because these things often and people will point to Ajax they'll point to even the the, the Liverpool team earlier uh, in its incarnation under FSG they'll talk about uh, other teams that have tried to do this and haven't been able to sustain it over the long period how do you do it? Well I think first of all you know player recruitment isn't a process that happens in two transfer windows each season it's a process that happens 365 days a year so we're constantly looking at the ways in which we can bring in players from different parts of the world. We're looking at the quality of those players. We're, we're looking at their coachability, our, our opportunity to develop the players when they come in, either within our club or, or through a different pathway, through loans um, at different levels and maybe sometimes even in different countries. And then it's a, a question of making sure we can blend that talent with what we've got in, in, in the building already through our own academy what we've got within our first team group and our under 21s group, and then making sure that we've got senior players around at the moment, the likes of Adam Lallana, Danny Welbeck, um, Pascal Gross, Lewis Dunn, James Milner, who can actually help nurture that talent, not just on the field, but off the field. And then, you know, there's a, a real judgment to be made about when we sell it and, and selling it at the right time so that we can remain competitive, give Roberto and his staff what they need to compete in the Premier League, which we know, is really difficult every single week, every single game. Tonight will be no exception. Um, but at the same time, for our business model to work, we, we need to be able to move those players on at the right time. Um, and that's, you know, that's a trick that, you know, we've been able to do pretty well over the last few years, but we don't get everything right. You know, there, there will always be decisions that we make on human beings that, that don't come off. And, you know, our, our philosophy is about trying to refine what we do every single day to be better. Um, and when it doesn't work, to establish why. And sometimes it's not a human failing on the part of the recruitment staff or the way the club has managed it. It may just be that a player doesn't settle, the family doesn't settle, the country doesn't feel quite right for them, or the league is a bit too tough um, for them at that moment in their career. And so we have to learn from that and, and see if we can refine the process, and then we go again. But 
as I say, over the last sort of few years, we, we've got more right than wrong, which is great, but we haven't got everything right. And, and there's still plenty we can do to improve. Paul, a lot of people always ask me about the recruitment element of football clubs, and I know different ones work differently. Your recruitment team stroke model, if you like, that department that's done so well, how in conjunction is that with the the manager at the time, whether it was Graham Park, where it's deserved be now? Because there's been a lot of criticism of Man United for giving Ten Hag a lot of autonomy in terms of theirs. Obviously, the Liverpool model I know a little bit more about. But has yours remained consistent, or is it always evolving, or does it does it depend on different things, or is it quite rigid? I think it has to evolve, Danny, because, as I say, we're learning things all the time and we're, and we're trying to improve that all the time. We, we never want to bring in players that the, that the head coach and the manager doesn't want because okay. there's, there's no point in that. Um, but at the same time, we, we want to be able to recruit within our, our model, um, the way we, we, we structure our wages, the way we, we, we pay our players. Um, you know, we're not the biggest club. We're not, we haven't got the greatest revenues, so we're never going to have the biggest player budget. So when we do go out to look for players, they've actually got to fit our model. Mm. They've obviously got to fit what the coach needs. That's very, very important, but they've also got to fit our model. And there's always going to be a time when, you know, in, in my experience and definitely yours, where, you know, a head coach will want a particular player who just isn't available or isn't gettable or we can't afford. Uh, but there'll be other players that, that through our model, we can find that we believe can be as good maybe not immediately, but over time, that will meet the coach's need. And it's about blending those two things together. What the coach, ne what the coach needs, what we can afford, who's gettable at the right time. Uh, and that's a process, as I say, that goes on 365 days a year. You know, we don't sit down with Roberto just ahead of the transfer window and start talking about what we might need. We're trying to think two, three, four transfer windows ahead about what might happen to the players yeah. we've got and therefore the players we will then need to bring in. So would it it's be not perfect science then. Yeah, no, I know that. Would, would it be unfair then, only a recent report, there's some suggestion that because De Zerbe's done so well, he's now generating, you know, the old argument, he's generally he's got more power and therefore he can dictate more what he wants. Or is that is that just a load of nonsense, people putting two two together? <laughs> no, nothing's changed. And, you know, the one thing we're really, really careful with is is making sure that when we bring head coaches in, they understand how we work and what, what our model is. Yeah. And Roberto's been been great. And he will always push, don't get me wrong, he will always push Every single day, he pushes us to be better, mm. uh, to find better talent, to be more competitive. Um, and, you know, as I said a couple of times recently, you know, whenever I come on to shows like this and talk about our vision of wanting to be an established top 10 Premier League club, which means being in the top 10 in the league more often than not, he's saying, Paul, why don't you talk about top six? Why don't you talk about better than top 10? So he's always pushing for better and more, which is quite unusual, as, as you know. A lot it's of a good thing, though, isn't it? It's a good thing. It's, 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 really it's, good. A, it's, a, good, it's really it's a good, good thing that he wants to do it. But is there is there a, a possibility that if you don't get where he wants you to go, he'll end up thinking that he has to to move on? And what what plans do you have if that is the case? Because he's had a lot of attention, even in the last six months or so. Bayern Munich have been uh, linked recently. I know the Liverpool link have co has called over the last twenty four hours or so. But people are talking about him. Well, we, we, we understand that. And I think if any of our coaching staff, our players or, or, or our non-football staff do well, we, we expect them to become, you know, targets uh, and desirable for other clubs. We're realistic about that mm. and we have a plan for that and we have a plan for every eventuality, whether it's the head coach, whether it's me, whether it's any other person in the club, we, we have to have succession plans in place. And we're not afraid of that because I think when... When, when change happens, it provides a different opportunity, a new opportunity for different energy, different ideas, and, and you know, you move forward in a different way. But Roberto's been brilliant to work with. We want to work with him for, 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 more, for, more, for more seasons to come. Um, and, you know, we'll try and, and always meet what he needs in order for the team to progress. And, and sometimes we'll be able to do that in one transfer window. Sometimes it might take two or three. Um, but all the while, we're always looking to improve. You know, we don't see us having a ceiling on our ambition, there'll always be a, a, a limit to, our, uh, to what we can achieve just simply because, as I said before, we don't have the resources of some of the bigger clubs. But what we can do is we can find smarter ways of competing and, and, and being better for ourselves. And if, if we can do that, then we've got a chance of, of beating some of the bigger teams 
each season and uh, obviously that's what we've been able to do over the last couple yeah you've had some great seasons FA Cup semi-finals high finishes in the Premier League Europa League campaign for the first time in the club's history um, you mentioned about wanting to work with Roberto for some seasons to come do you believe that he will be your manager next season <laughs> we hope so I mean we we have to plan for every eventuality and you know Roberto's under contract for, for a couple more years we, we we enjoy working with him we know he enjoys working with us and, and inside the club. He's ambitious. He's highly talented. He'll be sought after. We have to be ready and, and, and cognizant of, of, of an approach at any time. But that's the same, as I said before, for, for our best players and our best staff in all areas of the club. Um, and, you know, the trick for us is actually having a succession plan in place to make sure if, if there is a move, if there is a, a change, then we're able to be ready for it and we're able to carry on without any kind of uh, interruption to the way we work or any kind of damage to our momentum. Um, you know, we don't want to lose our best people and we go out of our way to try and protect ourselves against that. But we're also realistic and we know that people at all levels of, of football are in, ambitious and want to move on to the next level when the, the time is right or the opportunity arises. So we have to be cognizant of that, but we can't be scared of that. You know, we have to be prepared for it uh, and, and ready for it. So, so when you go to Real Madrid, Paul, there's already a plan in place to replace you, is there? <laughs> I was going to say, Dan, I can barely speak someone, English, let alone Spanish. <laughs> as someone who's just signed a, a, a new contract, you sign until 2030 now. There's, and there's lots of movement in the executive area in the Premier League in terms of uh, uh, CEOs and people that are, are in high-level positions. Because of the success, has there been an interest in you from elsewhere? Well, Tony Bloom and I are like an old married couple. I, I don't think that uh, we, we could actually sort of live apart. And, and I don't think anyone else would want me. You know, we, we've got complementary skill sets. You know, T Tony's very clever and I'm not. And, and uh, Tony's good on the numbers and, and I tend to be better with the words. So, you know, we, we work well together. We've enjoyed working together for 12 years. You know, he was the reason that, that I joined the club and, and he's the reason that I've stayed with the club because he has a very clear vision. He gives us room to operate. He, he gives us resources that, that, that give us the opportunity to compete. And every single day he's consistent in what he says and what he does. And, you know, in football, as we all know, that's not always, that's not always the case. And, you know, I've been really lucky to, 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 to work with Tony over this last 12 years. And, you know, when the opportunity was presented to, to sort of see out another five or six seasons together, um, to be honest, it wasn't a really difficult decision. I've really enjoyed it at Brighton. We've made progress every year, and I genuinely think we can we can make more progress over the next half a decade uh, to follow. So I'm looking forward to it. Paul, uh, Martin O'Neill here. Just um, first of all, just to uh, pay you a compliment for a start, uh, when I was the manager of the Republic of Ireland, I used to come down and watch some of your games, uh, whether it was an Irish player playing for you or against uh, you were always a terrific host to me. You looked after me brilliantly, so I'm I'm always eternally grateful for that. That was, but there was an Thanks, excitement Martin. around the club at that time to try and get into the Premier League, and close on one occasion, and then um, next time round, and it was fantastic. And there was a really there was a great atmosphere about the football club, which is leading me on now to my point. What is it's like everything else you've done so well. It's a What's the expectation from the fans now? Not about what's the expectation from you, but what is the expectation from the fans? Is it one of these, we, we've tasted European football, do we want more of that? Obviously they will do, and, and, and how can you accommodate that? <laughs> well, as you know, Martin, from your career, you know, when, when you have a little bit of success, the expectations go, go through the roof really quickly. Mm. And part of our challenge, and part of my challenge, I suppose, is, is is managing those expectations, but at the same time, managing Roberto's, because he's pushing us to be even better and, and push on and, and do even better things. And at the same time, we know that we're in a highly competitive league where there's clubs all around us and below us that, 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 that want to overtake us and are doing everything they can to do that. So, as I said, we don't feel that there's a ceiling to what we can achieve, but we're realistic about the time it can take and that there will be bumps in the road and there will be moments when maybe, you know, our processes and our methods and, and, and our progress, you know, will be doubted and will be questioned. And we, we accept that because we're not, you know, we're not one of those clubs that's got a, a, a cabinet full of trophies and, and titles. But at the same time, you know, we, we work really hard every day to be better. Yeah. Um, and we think we can carry on being better. The fans would love another season in Europe, but they're also very, uh, cognizant at uh, 26, 27 years ago, we were almost out of the football league. We were almost out of business. 
and therefore to be back where we are now just a quarter of a century later and, and, and playing you know some of the biggest teams in the world playing in European competition, getting to FA Cup semi-finals, announcing big profits. This is a very, very different era for the club and it's really exciting. And I think the fans are smart enough to know uh, that they've got to enjoy these moments. It's really important in football to to enjoy the moments when it's going well because there are plenty of moments when it doesn't go so well and it's not so nice. Um, and we all know that. So at the moment, you know, we're going to keep pushing, we're going to keep working hard, we're going to keep trying to be the best that, that we can be as our club. Um, not looking at anyone else with envy or, 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 or trying to, to be them. We just need to be ourselves and we just need to keep competing at, at the best level that we can. And one of the way of doing that is uh, by putting new entertainment stuff in and around the stadium, looking for uh, a new venue for the women's team, increasing the infrastructure around the stadium itself. Um, how else do, do Brighton continue to compete? Because Daniel Levy was talking this morning on the publication of Spurs' results, and he was suggesting that even they are now looking for investment, selling a stake in the club, because the Premier League is so competitive uh, that they need to get extra investment into the coffers in order to continue their upward trajectory. What does that tell you about the nature of the division itself and how fast it's growing and the competitiveness around it. Daniel's right. It's getting even harder, isn't it? And, and you know, if Tottenham are, are saying things like that with the stadium that they've got and the resources that they've got, then, you know, there's a warning shot across all of our bowels. But for us, we, we've, we've got to do the basic things well all the time. We've got to fill our stadium. We've got to make sure our sponsors are happy and want to stay with us and, and, and pay us the best value that we can secure from them. And then we've got to find new ways of generating more revenue. You know, we're opening in the summer a brand new external fan zone, which we hope will get many more people to our stadium earlier and have them leave later, which will give us the opportunity to generate more revenue from that. We can use that facility in between matches in order to generate more revenue. We want to be able to use our stadium more times in the year. I mean, we have this incredible building, but but we actually only really open it 25 times a year um, at the most. Um, and, you know, that's not enough. You know, we've got to make that asset work harder. Likewise, for our women's team, you know, we want to grow um, women's football. We want to make sure that our women's team are as well supported as our men's team. We don't think yet that the Amex is ready for our women's team or the women's team is ready for the, for the Amex. So we want to build a specific women's stadium that will focus on female athletes and a slightly different audience that, mm. that watch our women's team. And in itself, that will generate its own revenues and make our women's football um, operation more profitable and hopefully sustainable, which will then take the pressure off other areas of the club and, and allow it to become uh, a flourishing operation in its own right. So all these things are about the future and, and that's how we intend to try and compete going forward. Good luck to you, Paul. Thank you very much for coming on to discuss those record results. Uh, well Thanks, done Paul. to you, Antony, as well, and the rest of the club. I know it's a club that works together very well, completely integrated, and you can see that on the football pitch. Let's see where they go next. Brighton take on Brentford tonight, live on the TalkSport app. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app, and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.